Hey everyone! Today we're going to talk about Oliver Wyman numerical reasoning test and we're going to go through quite a few exercises. This session will be pretty long, so feel free to pause, save this link somewhere to your bookmarks and then come back to it later. Before we jump right in, I would like to talk about two things. First, please look into the description of this video because there I'll post all the links relevant to the discussion, all the materials, all the extra videos, everything you'll find necessary and useful. And second thing, if you find this particular video useful, please feel free to like it and share it with your friends and comment, because this way we'll know that you need it and that we're producing some good content. And that means we'll keep producing it. So that's it, now let's get started. Okay, so let's get started. Oliver Wyman numerical reasoning test. Here's a rough breakdown of question types. And you notice that the most important question types are equations, probability, and geometry, each accounting roughly for one third of the questions. And then there is compounding and everything else. What we're gonna do right now, we're gonna look through all the question types and study some of the relevant solution techniques that might be applicable in the test, or maybe in the interview as well. Let's start with equations. Number one, formula versus outright computation. Sometimes it's easier to do the computation rather than build a formula trying to solve the question. Just saves you time. I think this is a good example. Look at the question right now, try to build equation maybe, and then see how I would proceed with the solution without building the equation, just by computing stuff. So let's keep track of the number of downloads for each application from January to February and beyond. So we're gonna write January, we're gonna write February, March, and uh, you'll notice that even April will be enough. Let's write Insta and clap. So in January, uh, Insta had 300k downloads and Clapchat 200k. February, Clapchat 240 and Insta 310. Insta is the easier one because we just need to add 10k every month. Let's do it right now. 320k. 330k, if you were to write May, that would be 340k, etc. And you may notice that the growth of CLAP is faster because it's growing by a certain high growth rate rather than just by adding fixed number all the time. So the growth base is increasing for CLAP. So here, that was one fifth, that was 20%. So in March, that would be extra 20% as well. Then extra 20%, then extra 20%. So let's just calculate these numbers. So 20% of 240 is again 40 plus one fifth of 40. So that would be 240 plus 40 plus 8, which is 288k. Okay, clap is still beyond, uh, below Instagram, uh, but will it be below in April? Let's check that. So now we roughly have 290 for easy computation, and then we need to add extra 20%, which would be Roughly 290 plus, plus what? Plus 40 for 200k. And then we need to add 20% for 90k. 20% for 90k is uh, roughly, what was that? I think it's roughly 20, slightly below 20. And that should be, that should be 18. So the number here would be 290 
uh, the number will definitely be bigger than 330. That will be 330 from here already. And then plus 18. We don't even need to compute it because now we see that uh, clap has overcome Insta. So April should be our answer. Clap will overtake Insta BNB by monthly downloads in April. Easy, right? You just need to make the computation. You don't need to build a huge formula here because you don't need to compute much after all. That's a rule of thumb, actually. Try to do the computation first. Maybe you will realize that it's an easy approach. If so, awesome. Another question concerns distance. Distance as the product of speed and time. So I have two roads of equal length. Let's call it A and B. And the length of A is speed on A times time on A. The length on B is speed on B times time on B, right? So, and in order to find the total length of the road, we just need to sum up A and B, right? And then what we need to do is find the average speed. And the average speed, average, is nothing but total distance divided by total time. So total distance here is A plus B, and total time here is TA plus TB. Yeah, and the thing is that we know the length of A. It's just five miles. Same thing here, b is just 5 miles. So uh, our expression gets simpler, 10 over ta plus tb. But now we need to find the times. And finding the times from this expression is quite easy. We just need to calculate ta is 5 miles over the speed, which is 5 over what? over 50 miles per hour, over 50. So that will be one tenth. And then one tenth of an hour. And then same thing for TB, five over 30. This is one sixth. Okay, we are ready to calculate this, the average speed now. 10 over one tenth plus one sixth, which is nothing but 10. Okay, so to get here, we need to multiply this by five and this by three. So that will be five plus three over, over 30. And then this is 30 times 10 over eight. And then this is nothing but 15 times 5. So I took 2 out of here, took 2 out of here. So I took 4 and then I have just 2 left. 15 times 5 over 2, which is 75 over 2, which is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue here, which is nothing but... 37.5 miles per hour. And this is our answer. Weighted average. So that might be a bit of a bigger problem compared to the previous one, of course, but you'll soon realize that there's just a simple equation that we're gonna build here. So we see the weights, 20% of estimation questions, 40% word problems, conclusion questions and the rest client interpretation. So what, what, uh, what's gonna be the rest is, this is 60, this is 85, so the rest is just 15%. If a candidate scored nine to an estimation question, so the grade, the final grade will be 90% on estimation questions, is 20, then 70%, on word problems and then 60 60 percent on conclusion and then this score and client's interpretation is is not known yet we'll put an x 
and we put the weight 15. So, and we need to compare this number to the passing mark of 80. So this V is nothing but a comparison sign. So let's do the computations now. 18%, 28% plus one fourth, one quarter of 60. 15% plus 0.15x compared to 80%. So this is 18 plus 28, 46. This 46 plus 15 is 61%. So 15x versus 80%. And now we need to compare 15x versus, versus what? 9, 19%. Now, and we notice right away, we, even without further computation, that x will be bigger than 100, right? Because if it were 100, then we would have uh, 0.15x on the left-hand side and point. 15 or 15% 15 on the right hand side. Whereas we see here that 15% of X is actually bigger than 15. So X should be bigger than 100%. And that means that unfortunately the candidate will not be able to pass the test given this information. Because it's not possible to score more than 100% on, on any question type. The answer is E. Another exercise on weighted average. And this is an interesting one because here we'll find out that we don't have enough information. And let's figure out why. Okay, we have, we have what? Three plane types. And from these plane types, we can calculate the number of seats that are actually occupied. So we can calculate the occupation by each plane type. But the problem is that we don't know the number of small planes, medium planes, and large. We just know the total number, 250. So in order to do the calculation for the number of passengers who leave Sheremetyevo every day, we would need to do something like number of seats, seats small times number of planes small, plus number of seats medium times number of planes medium and then number of seats large times number of planes large and we know this number we know this number Oh, rather we can calculate this number. 50%, 50 seats times 80%, 150 seats times 80%, 300 seats times 80%. But these numbers here are unknown to us. What we know is that the sum is 250. But we don't know uh, whether there are more large planes or more medium planes, more small planes, or what combination thereof uh, departs from Shermetyevo each day. So the answer here is we need more information. So far we cannot tell how many passengers depart from Shermetyevo. And the answer is E. Two-step calculation. Two-step calculation means just that we need to perform two steps in order to solve the problem, right? We cannot solve it by building one equation. Oh, rather, by building one equation, we'll be uh, losing more time than by doing it by steps. And the steps are quite simple, by the way. You have this equation here, the number of bikes sold in a given month. The problem is that we have this unknown here, W. We need to figure out what W is before we can plug in the numbers for, uh, for the new pricing and then figure out the number of bikes that would be sold. But 
getting W out of this equation is easy because we have the, you know, the value for uh, this price point, $100. And then that would be B1 equals 40K uh, over price one plus W. And we know that B1 is 250 and P1 is 100. So from here, we can conclude that 25K plus 25W equals 40K. So 25, zero, so 250 W equals 15 K. That means W is 15 or 250. So we can get away, so we can get rid of zeros. And then 150 divided by 25 is six. And then add the missing zero, which is 60. So W is 60. Now that we know what W is, we can easily compu compute B2, which is 40K over P2 plus W, which is 40 over P2 here is 140 and W is 60. So this is nothing but four. This is nothing but 40k or 200, which is 200, and the answer is 200 C. Okay, now it's getting even more difficult because we'll have to deal with a quadratic equation here and with what's called Vieta's formulas. The good thing about Vieta's formulas is if you know them by heart, you can solve this question in your head without doing any calculations whatsoever. But for now, I think I'm still going to show how to do the calculations on paper so that you can practice mentally on your own. In 12 years time, Jack's age will be the square of his current age. So his current age is unknown. But in 12 years, which is x plus 12, will be the square of his current age equals x squared. How old is he now? Okay, this is just a quadratic equation. There are several ways to solve it, but I'm gonna show you the simplest, I think. x squared minus x minus 12 equals zero. For a generic quadratic equation, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, if the roots of the equation exist, then, and the roots are x1 and x2, then their sum is nothing but minus b over a, and their product is nothing but c over a. This is what is called Vieta's formulas. And here the application is super easy, right? Because the numbers are easy to compute. The sum would be minus one over one taken with a minus sign, uh, sign so it's just one and then the product will be minus 12. Okay so from here we can conclude that there are two roots uh, the difference in, uh, in absolute values is very small just one and that uh, one of the roots is negative one of the roots is positive and that the product of their absolute values is 12. So I can guess that x1 is minus three and x4, x, sorry, x2 is four. And we can check that easily. The sum of these roots is one and their product is minus 12. Moreover, if we gonna plug in those numbers in the original equation we'll see for 
x equals minus 3, for example. 3 squared plus 3 minus 12 equals 0. Well, that's correct. And then 4 squared minus 4 minus 12 equals 0. Well, that's correct again. But of course, age cannot be negative, right? So in, ma in mathematics, that would be all right, but in common sense, that will just be stupid. So we're going to cross this one out, and then we claim that the answer is 4. So now Jack is 4 years old. Okay, now we're moving to systems of linear equations. Of course, most of systems of just two linear equations can be solved by building a complex or linear equation, just one linear equation. But here I think it will be much easier to use two equations rather than one because it's easier to track things and what's going on in your solution by looking at the equations separately rather than by looking at them uh, simultaneously. So let's translate what we have here in English into the language of math. X is 50% larger than Y, so X is 1.5y and only 50% the size of z. So x is just 0.5z. What percentage of z is y? So we need to figure out z, some number, y. Okay, x equals 1.5y and x equals 0.5z means that these things have the same, right? 1.5y equals 0.5z. But we need an expression for z. So we're gonna write z equals 1.5y over 0.5 Point. That's a point, yep. So z is nothing but 3y. And we look at the answers and see nothing related to 300. Hmm, interesting. And then I think, what's going wrong here? And then I realized that I misread the question. The question says, what percentage of z is y? So it's not uh, z equals, equals something times y. It's actually y equals something times z. So here that would be y equals one-third of z. So the answer should be 33%. I think my mistake here was quite instructive because on the one hand it showed how important it is to read the question statement carefully so that you're not solving the wrong question. And then, on the other hand, it's important to check yourself. And if you see that the answer option that you found is not there, you just need to figure out what went wrong. And oftentimes what went wrong is your misunderstanding of the question or some of the numbers. That's exactly what I did. I read everything once again carefully. I figured out my mistake and I fixed it just by moving three from right-hand side to left-hand side. So that's it. Read question statement carefully and check yourself. Another question on systems of linear equations. This one is a bit more difficult this time. So let's say that a pizza costs P dollars and cola costs C dollars. So team buys three pizzas, three times P, plus seven bottles of color, seven C, and this is $60 in total. This is one equation. Another equation is given by this information here. A pizza costs $10 more than a bottle of cola. So P is C plus 10. All we need to do is solve this system of equations now. And uh, the solution is quite simple. We just need to plug in this number into this equation. So getting rid of uh, one unknown in one of the equations. So I'm going to write P equals C plus 10. But this equation here becomes 3C times 
3 times 10, which is 30, plus 7c equals 60. So that means, that means 10c plus 30 equals 60, and p equals c plus 10. And that means c equals 60 minus 30 over 10 equals equals what? Equals 3. And then p is just c plus 10 or 13. Right? So that's a simple system of linear equations and then the solution is 13 and 3. And what are we asked about actually? We're asked about how much does a bottle of cola cost? And the answer is here, 3. Another system of linear equations and this time I think slightly more difficult than the previous ones. But again, the technique is same as before. We just need to figure out the language of math hidden behind the words, and we need to build two equations. And solve these questions as we did previously. Each person in a certain apartment complex either owns a dog or a cat, or does not have a pet at all. The number of cats in the apartment complex was four times the number of dogs. Okay, so dog, cat, or nothing, zero. The number of dog of cats in the apartment complex was four times. C equals four times the number of dogs. Now that Bora and his three cats have moved to another city, so that means minus three, there are 47 pets left in the apartment complex. Plus D equals 47. So that's it. And we we're asked about the number of dogs. So the answer should be number of dogs, or D. So let's solve now. Again, let's plug in this, this value here into the second equation so that it becomes 4D minus 3 plus D equals 47. C equals 4D and 5D equals 50. Which means that D is 10 and C is what? 40. And we are asked about D, so the answer is 10. That's it, 10. Okay, this is probability and combinatorics. Very good. I think this is much more interesting than the previous stuff with the questions, but also more difficult. Difficult in the sense of figuring out what to do. Once you figure out how to calculate something, the calculation becomes quite easy. But understanding what's need, what needs to be calculated is more difficult than in the case of equations. So let's jump right in. How many ways are there to place a blank domino on an 8x8 chessboard so that it covers exactly two squares, not counting rotations? So the way to approach such questions, well, uh, for that matter, I think most questions in mathematics, is to try and uh, picture the solution in your mind. So you need to figure out how you, you would actually place those blank dominoes on the 8x8 chessboard understand the process of placing the dominoes. And then once you understand it quite well, you can quantify it pretty easily. So what we're gonna do right now, in order to understand this process, we're gonna start drawing. Yeah, I understand that my drawing skills are not that awesome, but... This is a picture of a chessboard, a rough picture, of course. And then we have a blank domino. What, what does a domino look like? 
Domino is this thing here. So you can place it this way or you can place it on the side. Notice that the board is actually looks the same whether we look at it from this side or from this side. That means that if we solve this exercise for the situation of the vertically standing domino here, the answer would be nothing but this result here times 2, because the same logic would be applicable to a solution from, from this side. So let's get rid of this horizontal standing domino for now and focus on the vertical standing domino first. So how can we place a domino uh, on the chessboard so that uh, we follow the assignment of the exercise? So we can place it here, or we can place it here, or we can place it here, or here, or here. This is, uh, you notice, seven ways to place a domino in one column, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah. And also, uh, again, we're considering only dominoes of this type. We don't put them horizontally because horizontally, horizontal placement will be considered one, once we multiply everything by two. So one domino can occupy only one uh, column. And the number of possible opportunities in one column is seven. Num the number of columns is eight. So the total number of vertical placement opportunities is seven times eight equals 56. And now here comes the doubling that we discussed previously. We need to multiply 56 by 2 to account for horizontal placement of the dominoes as well, which will be the same thing, just uh, with a linear transformation, so to speak, of the board. So it's nothing but 56 times 12, 112. So this is the number of ways to place a domino on the chessboard so that it meets the requirements of this question. The answer is B. Very good. Let's move forward. Okay, least possible states. This is a good example of how you can think structurally in math questions, how you are required to think structurally. Uh, once you figure out how to do it in math, I think it becomes much easier in solving cases as well. So that's why consulting companies pay so much attention to math questions and like hiring math grads or uh, engineering grads so much. Just because the structuring skill in uh, math or sciences is very similar to structuring skill in consulting. Oh, I guess structuring skill is just the same everywhere. What I'm talking about, we need to structure the possible states in this question and then calculate the number of states that meet our requirements. And the states are as follows. Houses, now offices here. House one, house two, house three. The first state is when everyone gets the right, the right, the first state is when everyone gets the right package. The second state is when the first gets the right package, but the second and third get the wrong packages. Then I have a state when the first gets the wrong package. And the wrong package can be either from the, from the second or the third office. And here we have two possibilities. Either this one gets the package from the first office and the third office gets their package or vice versa. So the, so the second office gets the package from the third office and the third office gets the package from the first office. And the same thing happens here. We can give this package to the second office and the first package to the third office. 
or vice versa. One, two. So, so far we've listed all the possible states, right? How do we know it's all the possible states? Because the number of possible states is nothing but three times the, the number of offices where the first package can be delivered times two, the number of offices where the second package can be delivered. It's not three because we cannot deliver this uh, two packages to one office. And then times one, the number of offices where the last package can be delivered. And again, it's just one office. We don't have one much choice. If we deliver two packages to two offices, there's just one office left. So the total number is six. And here the number of states is six. So that means, and if we look that, uh, at the states and see that all the states are different, we see that we covered all the possibilities for the delivery. So we've been pretty messy here because we covered all the possible options and at the same time, uh, the options are different. They don't uh, cross each other. Messy. So the last step we need to perform is calculate the probability that he gets every single one wrong. Every single one wrong is definitely not here, not here, not here because this one is okay, and not here. So. This one, this combination is wrong, and this combination is uh, every single package wrong. So two combinations out of six. And then the probability is nothing but the number of states that suit our requirements over the total number of states, which is one third. You can just understand, you can just calculate the number of ways uh, you can construct this wrong, this state, a wrong delivers. So, uh, if we take the first package, for example, it can be delivered to the wrong address in two ways, right? It can be either delivered to the second or to the third office to mess things up. But then if we take the second package, it can be delivered to the wrong office only in one instance because because we can deliver it to office number three, which is okay, means it's wrong, or we can deliver it to office number two, and then the delivery will be correct. So the number of ways is one. And the third package can be delivered to the wrong address only in Y way, provided that the previous package was delivered to the wrong way. So the answer is two, the number of states where all the packages are delivered to the wrong recipient. And then again, we come to this calculation here. Here we need to list possible states again, but this listing will help us understand that the desired probability is actually zero. Let's look at those states right now. So we have five countries and five cities. And we need to get exactly one country capital pair wrong. Let's just prove that it's not possible. We cannot have exactly one country capital pair wrong, we'll have more pairs. Let's try to construct an example where we would have one country capital pair wrong. So let's assume that we take country number one, but we can take any country for that matter, fix it and make the country capital pair wrong by connecting it with city number two. Again, we can connect it to any other city but city number one to make the pair wrong. And then we need to connect all the other cities in the right way. So the third country and the third city, fourth country and fourth city, fifth country and fifth city. But here we are left with another country capital pair, which will be wrong as well. 
country 2 and city 1. Because we cannot connect country 2 with city 2, because we cannot assign the same city capital to several countries. That means that this connection will lead to another wrong country capital pair. That means that we are not able to construct a state where there is just one country capital pair wrong. So the number of desired states is zero. And that means that the probability of this event is zero. The answer is A. Another probability question which we can solve by listing all the possible states. Well, I think that's the simplest but also the most time-consuming approach. I'm going to do it right now, but then I'm going to show you another quicker solution to this question. So we have four coins. And I'm going to, uh, for the sake of notation, I'm going to say that zero equals tails and one signifies heads. And we know that there are actually 16 possibilities for the different values of these numbers. Because it's 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. 2 to the power of 4, which is 16. And then I'm going to write all these numbers out. Okay, now we just need to repeat the same thing here with one as the first number. So head on the first coin. If you're familiar with calculation with base two rather than commonly used base 10, you'll recognize that, that this number is nothing but zero in base two. This is one. This is 2, this is 3, this is 4, 5, 6, 7, etc. And those numbers will be, of course, 8, 9, up to 15. And again, notice that uh, we are interested in even number of heads. So this one. This one, this one, and this one. One, two, three, four. Four states where we have even number of heads. And similar thing will be here, if we just draw it again. We'll have four situations with even number of heads. So the total will be 4 plus 4 out of 16 equals, surprisingly, 1 half. So the probability that we'll get a new number of heads is 50%. Well, that's, I think, the simplest solution, but also the most time-consuming, because you need to draw, at least somewhere in your head, or preferably on paper, all those states which takes time. And if the question were asked about uh, not four coins, but, I don't know, 20 coins, uh, it will be very difficult to solve by listing all the possible states. But fortunately, there is another solution technique that you can use that will significantly save you time. And that's called proof by induction. Proof by induction uh, is essentially building a hypothesis and then proving that if the hypothesis holds for the value of n coins, then it will also holds for the value of n plus 1 coins. Our hypothesis here, which is quite easy to come up with, thinking that heads and tails are probably have equal probability, is that the answer 
answer for any number of coins is 50% for any number which is whole, of course. And well, coming up with this hypothesis is easy because if you look at ants of one, we just throw one coin, the probability that we get an even number of heads, this time it's uh, zero heads, is 50%. Now, how we're gonna do the proof by induction is, let's say that this is true for ants k. So ants k is 50%. We need to prove that from this assumption follows that ends k plus 1 equals, should equal 50%. Now, and it's easy to prove, right? Because the, ends, the answer for k plus 1 is nothing but the probability that we get an even number of heads on the previous step times the probability that we get a tail this time so that we don't spoil the even number of heads and the probability on this new uh, k plus first coin is 50 percent but also we can get an odd number of heads on the previous on the previous step i'm gonna write uh, ends uh, upper score means the odd number of heads times the probability that we get a head on k plus first on k plus first coin because uh, that means that the odd number of uh, previous heads plus an odd number one equals even number of heads and by assumption this number is 50 percent and this number is 1 minus 50%, uh, again 50%. So the total number is 25% plus 25% equals 50%. So that means that if we assume that this expression holds for k, it also necessarily holds for k plus 1, if we add one more coin. So the proof is now complete. That means that if you have not four fair coins, but any number, 100 fair coins, or I don't know, 1 billion fair coins, the answer would still be 50% uh, because we just proved it. We build a hypothesis and we prove this hypothesis. It looks cool, right? This is an exercise on independent events, meaning that one event happens without any link to the previous event. When we throw one coin, the probability that we get a head is 50%. When we throw the second coin, the prob probability that we get a head is again 50%. Uh, the previous state that we were, uh, the previous state that we were in does not affect this new state. We still get a head with a 50% probability. And, but if we want to calculate the probability that we get head on our first step and the head on our second step, we need to multiply those probabilities of these independent events and the probability of getting two heads in uh, two attempts would be 50% times 50% equals 25%. I'm gonna apply this same logic to this question, which is a bit more difficult in that we don't have this 50%, we just have x. But the logic does not change. What is the probability of getting one head and one tail after two spins? Okay, so we can get head on the first spin and tail on the second spin, or we can get tail on the first spin and head on the second spin, and both of these states meet our criteria. Uh, the states uh, are very similar. They're just uh, 
symmetric, so to speak. So if we do the computation for this state, we don't need to do the computation for that state. We just need to multiply this answer by two. So let's focus on this question then. What's the probability of getting head on our first spin and getting a tail on our second spin? The prob probability of getting head on our first spin is x. Yeah, because the coin lands heads with probability x. And the probability of getting a tail on the second spin is 1 minus x. And then the probability of getting a head on the first spin and a tail on the second spin, so those two events together, will be just the product of these probabilities. 1 x times 1 minus x. So this is the probability of this state. And then the probability of this state will be the same thing. Because if we repeat the logic, but for tails and heads rather than heads and tails, we'll again arrive at x, 1 minus x. Or rather, 1 minus x times x, but it doesn't matter. So our answer in this case would be nothing but x times 2 times 1 minus x, which is 2x minus 2x squared. And this is, this is d. Very good. Okay, conditional probabilities is when the next event depends on the outcome of the previous event. For example, if we want to allocate balls in boxes. And the same thing applies actually to our exercise with packages and offices. Once we deliver a package to an office, we cannot deliver another package to the office, to the same office. So the probability for the next event is uh, affected by what happened in the previous event. So we cannot just uh, multiply 50% times 50% times 50%, oh, 33% in that case, being the wrong or right delivery. The next probability changes versus previous probability. And this exercise here is a good example of how we can demonstrate that. So we have seven people, and what's the probability that one person within the group will have been born on each day of the week? So we're gonna have, I'm gonna write it down, we're gonna have seven people, and what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna construct the overall probability of this state uh, by steps, one by one. So the probability that we have one person uh, who has a birthday on some day of the week, well, th that's of course a quite useless event because every person has a birthday on some day of the week. So that probability is one. But then in a group of two people, what's the probability that each person has a birthday on, on a different day of the week. So that will be the probability for the first person, fixed, times the probability that the second person has a birthday on a different day of the week. That would be six over seven, because there are six days left, not occupied by the first person's birthday, uh, over seven overall days of the week. Then what is the probability of three people in a group of three having birthdays on different days of the week. That would be one times six seventh times five seventh. And you notice the pattern, right? Uh, if you want to calculate the same number for four people, that would be four seventh, then three seventh, five, then two, seven, six, and then seven people, one, seven. Because when there is just one person left, uh, this person has to have a birthday on a specific day that is left free when we allocated all the remaining days, so to speak, to, to the remaining six people. And this is our answer. I was talking about conditional probabilities here because the probability of the next person being born 
on a, a day that's not occupied by anyone uh, is affected by how many people we had before. So if we want to allocate eight people, for example, to seven days, we won't be able to do that because the probability for the eighth person, person being born on a new date, not occupied by anyone else, would be zero. And this is, by the way, a good example of the Dirichlet box principle, uh, somewhat related to this exercise. And by the way, if interested, you can uh, watch the video on that topic uh, via link in the comment section below. So the answer here is 7 to the power 6 in the denominator and then 1 times 2 times 3 times everything uh, times 6 in the numerator. And this is E. Mm -hmm. Conditional probabilities. Once again, we have a pack of four cards with numbers 1 to 4. We need to find the probability that they are in order from top to bottom, 1, 2, 3, 4. So the probability that the first card lands on the first uh, place the probability that the first card lands on the first spot is one-fourth. The probability that the second card lands on the second spot is one-third, because it cannot land on the first spot anymore. The first spot is occupied by the first card. The probability that the third card lands on the third spot is one-half. And the probability that the fourth card lands on the fourth spot is one, because all the other spots are occupied by now, and we can place it only on the fourth spot. So the product of these four numbers is 12, 24, 1 over 24. So this is our desired probability. This is another exercise on conditional probabilities. Here it's a bit trickier though, because we'll need to deal with division by three and residuals. So, uh, in order for a number to be divisible by three, obviously the residual should be uh, zero. In order for the sum of two numbers, A and B, to be divisible by three, we need, of course, that the sum of the residuals of the division of a and b by 3 would be 0 or 3 or any any number divisible by by 3 not actually it, it, it can only be 3 of course uh, so for example if a uh, divided by 3 gives a residual of 2 and b divided by uh, 3 gives a residual of 1 the sum will be divisible by 3 I'll give an example 5 plus plus 7. So fi 5 gives a residual of 2 when divided by 3, and 7 gives a residual of 1 when divided by 3. The sum is 12, and it's divisible by 3. Okay, so if you take a random number 1 to 10, what matters actually is the residuals that we're gonna get in this case. So I'm gonna write out 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So the residual here is 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1. Okay, the interesting thing is here we have more uh, residuals of 1 than residuals of 2 and 0. So this would suggest that we would need to take this fact into account and calculate the probability of getting the residual of 2 uh, when we get a random number from 1 to 12. But this is actually not necessary, as I'm going to show you right now. If on the first step we get a random number for 1, the probability that on the second step we get a number that if at the first step we get number one, the probability that at the second step we get some number that when summed up with one is divisible by three is actually one third. And you, you can notice it easily because you can get 
and the second step. Any number, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and the residuals would be one, two, zero, one, two, zero, one, two, zero, one, two, zero. In order for the sum of number A and number B here to be divisible by 3, given that A is 1, we need to have the residual of number B to be equal to 2. So that would be a situation 2, 5, 8, or 11. And the probability of this situation is just one third, four over 12. Okay, so if we get one, the probability that uh, a plus b will be eventually divisible by three is one third. But the interesting thing is that now we can repeat the same logic for two. If we get two on our first step, the probability that a plus b will be divisible by three is nothing but one third again, because we need to add one, we need to add a number divisible uh, that divided by three gives the residual of one, and the probability of getting this number is just one third, because we have one, two, three, four out of 12 situations where we get the residual of one. One third. And the same thing with 3, the same thing with 4, etc, etc. So whatever number we get on our first step, any random number from 1 to 10, the probability that once we throw a random number from 1 to 12, the result will be divisible by 3, is just one third. So actually the random number at the first step doesn't matter. And this uh, exploration here was necessary only for coming up with the final idea, but not for any calculations. So the answer is one-third. Okay, so now let's switch gears to geometry. Geometry is actually fun if you have good imagination and if you know some rules. Uh, I'm going to tell you about these rules right now and uh, help you test your imagination. Hope you enjoy the exercises. ABC is a triangle. Uh, with AB of length 3 and uh, BC 8 centimeters, and we need to uniquely determine the length of AC and see if uh, any of the options fails to do that. When I start solving a geometry question, first thing I do is I start drawing, because my imagination is not that great so that I could do everything in my head. I need to draw to help myself problem solve. So A, a, B, C, A, B, C. Now let's run through all the options one by one and check if we can uniquely understand, determine the length of AC. A, the perimeter of ABC three times the length of AC. Well, uh, AC is unknown of course, but we can build an equation uh, based on these numbers. And from this equation, we can calculate AC. So A is out. The area of ABC is 12 square centimeters. If we know the area, we know the angle between AB and BC. And if we know the angle, we know the length of AC. We can calculate it at least. So this is out. ABC is isosceles. Uh, that is, it has two sides for the same length. Well, this is a tricky one, because uh, on the one hand, you don't know which sides have the same length. Obviously, it's not AB and BC, so it can be either BC and AC, these two sides here, or it can be AB and AC, these two sides here. But on the other hand, upon more thorough consideration, you understand that AB and AC cannot be of the same length, right? Because if AB is three, AC is also three, then the sum of AB and AC is six, 
which is smaller than BC. And we know that uh, the sums of the length of two sides, and we know that the sum of the length of two sides of a triangle, any two sides, is necessarily bigger than the remaining side. Because otherwise it won't be a triangle, it would be something like this. Eight, three, three. This is not a triangle anymore. So the situation AB equals AC is not possible. So that means that BC should be equal to AC. And that again uniquely identifies the length of AC. So C is out. D, ABC is right angle triangle. Let's check if we can use this information to identify the lengths of AC. The problem here is that we don't know uh, where the right angle will be. Obviously, the right angle cannot be ACB because uh, the side AB is just too small to be hypotenuse. But the right angle can't be ABC. And then we can calculate AC and that will be one value. But also the right angle could be uh, BAC and then BC would be hypotenuse. And that would give us a different value for AC. So that seems that, a, that option D fails to uniquely determine the length of AC. So in our case, D is the right answer. What is the ratio of median of an equilateral triangle to its perimeter? So equilateral means that all the sides are the same length. Very good. Let's draw as always. A, B, C. So if the sides are the same length, that means we can deal with any median. The, the, the length of the medians will be the same. So let's take this median, for example, BM. Median means that the length of AM is the same as length of AMC. But in the case of equilateral triangle, a median is also a height. So the, uh, the angle uh, BMC is uh, pi over two. This knowledge will help us calculate the length of BM because this angle in a uh, equilateral triangle is 60 degrees, so BM is AB times, times sine 60 degrees equals AB square root of 3 over 2. And the perimeter would be AB plus BC plus AC, just three AB. Now, the ratio of the median to the perimeter is BM over P equals AB three, square root of three over two, over three AB. And this is square root of 3 over 6. Or we can write it as square root of 3 over 6 or 1 over 2 square root of 3. I just got rid of, of square root on the left hand side and the right hand side. And the answer here is B. Okay, the perimeter of a square park has recently doubled. How many times has the area increased in size? Let's draw again. Square park, perimeter is just 4a, and now it doubled, so it means that it's now 8a. So that means that it's 4 times 2a. So that means that the length of one side is now 2a rather than 1a. So this is the new length, new length, and then the area is 
2a squared, which is 4a squared, which is 4 times the initial area. Therefore, the area of the park has increased 4 times. The answer is b. In this exercise, we have a hexagon and a circle. And hexagon is drawn inside the circle and it touches, uh, touches the circle. So we just need to compare the areas of the hexagon and the circle. So let's say that uh, the radius is r and the hexagon contains six triangles uh, with same sides. So that would be r, that would be r, that would be r, etc. So the, so the area of the hexagon is six areas of the triangle. And the area of a triangle will be one half times r squared times the sine of the angle uh, between two sides. And that would be 60 degrees. So that would be 3 r squared times square root of 3 over 2. And we can write it as 3 times square root of 3 r squared over 2. And the area of the circle will be pi r squared. So now I'm going to continue here. The area of the hexagon over the area of the circle is 3 square root of 3 r squared over 2 over pi r squared. Get rid of r squared and then we get 3 square root of 3 over 2 pi. Do we have such an option? Yes, we do. It's here. And the answer is C. In this exercise, we need to take a rectangle 5 by 9 and cut 1 centimeter of each side. And we need to understand by how much the area has decreased. Let's draw again. I always like drawing. And then this is 5, this is n, so the area here is 45. Now if we cut uh, 1 centimeter off each side, what we're going to get is the following. We're going to get 5 minus 2 equals 3, 9 minus 2 equals 7. So this will be S1, S2 is 3 times 7, 21. And now we need to understand what percentage of the error of the old photograph is the error of the new one. So S2 over S1, now we take 21 over 45, and that's 7 over 15. And this is, this is roughly 50% but not quite there yet, so it's slightly smaller than 50%. We need to find an answer that's slightly smaller than 50%. Definitely not E, not D, not C. A or B? Well, A is not slightly small, smaller than 50% because we need to subtract 13%, more than 10% out of uh, 50. So A is also out, and the answer is probably B. You can do the calculations, of course, but calculations are time-consuming here. And given the options, it's easy to understand which option fits and which options don't fit. And the answer here is B. Okay, here we need to deal with several uh, areas, and we need to sum those areas up to understand the total of the space of two buildings. So that's not difficult because the areas are just rectangles. Building A has area 10 meters by 55 meters on each of two floors. So I have this thing here, this thing here. Sorry, that should be same, same length. So that will be 100 by 55, and this is 100 by 55. And then building B has uh, 60 meters by 55 meters.
Okay, the figures are not drawn to scale, you understand. Just they're drawn just to give an idea what we need to compute. 60. Again, 60, 55. So what we need to do in this exercise is just sum those areas up. How are we gonna do it? 55 times 100 times 2 plus 55 times 60 times 3. Okay, so, so 55 times 2 is 110. 110 times 100 is 11k. And then 55 times 60 times 3 is 110 times 30 times 3. I took 2 from here into here for easier calculation. So it's 110 times 90. So it's 9, 9 and 2 zeros. That's it. And the answer is then uh, 11k plus almost 10k. That should be almost 21k, but slightly below that. So that should be 20,900 square meters. Do we have such an option? No, no, yes. Here it is. That's our answer. Mm -hmm. So this exercise is more interesting, I think. We have a circular park. Let's draw it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know I'm not such a good painter. So this is the center of it. And uh, normally Tim walks through the center of the park from his home to the station. Uh, but today he's not able to walk here, it says. He has to walk around the park. So he has to walk here. We need to understand how many more meters he'll need. To. So the diameter, you know, HS is one kilometer. So the radius, this thing here, is 50 meters. And uh, usually he walks this distance. He walks the diameter. But now he walks half of the circumference. The circumference, this total length, would be 2 pi r. And uh, this time I'm putting a, a letter L here. So when Tim has to walk H L S, he has to walk one second half of the circumference, 2 pi r. So he has to walk pi r. So he has to walk 5 times pi meters. The question is how many more meters team will have to walk. So we need to take the delta. We need to subtract 500 meters times 2, which is the diameter, uh, from 500 pi. So let's take for simplicity that pi is 314. Yeah, I'm oversimplifying it, but that's okay for the numbers here. And uh, then uh, 3 times 14 times 500 is what? 1500 times 5 and 70 minus 1000, which is the, di the distance that he usually walks. And the delta in this case is 570 or 570 meters. So this is the extra distance that Tim will have to walk. He'll have to walk extra uh, 570 meters. Do we have such an option? Yeah, it's here. Yep, the answer is A. 
Solid geometry is the most complex type of questions that you can see well, overall in geometry, but in uh, Oliver Wyman tests as well. Luckily, we don't really need to draw those uh, complicated things. We just need to read the question carefully and understand what, what we need to calculate. Here it's pretty simple. A regular dodecahedron, so means 12 dodecahedron, has 12 pentagonal faces. Okay, 12 faces at each corner, three faces touch. How many corners does it have? Pentagonal faces means uh, five sides on each face and also five corners. And if there are 12 faces with five corners each, we would assume that there are 60 corners overall. But be careful because here we did double or even triple counting because there are three faces touching each corner. So the total number of corners should be 60 over 3 to avoid triple counting. And that is 20. 20 corners is our answer. By the way, for, for the sake of interest, uh, here is the dodecahedron. Section number four, which is much smaller than all the previous three sections, is about compounding. And we're going to cover it pretty quickly because you'll see it's, it's quite easy. Part four, compounding. So this is how you would approach compounding questions. Again, the easiest way to solve a question is just uh, go ahead with straightforward computation. And this example clearly shows that uh, very often that's indeed the right decision. Alpha sales were uh, 300K in 2015 and their growth rate was 16% annually in three years. Actually, two years, 15, 16, 17. Every year, beta sales were 100K more than alphas. Which of the following is best estimate of the average annual growth for beta between 15 and 17? Let's just compute things out. So, year 2015, year 2016, year 2017. Alpha and beta. 300K and then plus 16% and then plus 16% again. So in 2016, that should be that should be 16 times 3 roughly because 16% uh, out of 100 would be 16 and 16% out of 300 would be 16 times 3. So that should be 3. Okay, 348, that's the answer. And then same growth rate for 2017 would imply again 48 and then 16%, 16% is roughly one sixth, one sixth out of 48. So I'm gonna write 348 plus 48 plus 16% out of 48, which is roughly one sixth out of 48, which is eight. So that should be 96 plus 8, 404, and we're talking about thousands here, of course. Okay, so we have the numbers for A, for alpha. So we need to compute the same thing for beta. It's 400K in the first year, 448K in the second year, and 504K in the third year. And the average annual growth rate in this case would be 48 out of 400 and then 56 out of 448. 48 out of 400 is slightly more than 10%, but not, not much more than 10%. 
I guess that should be something like 12 or 14. So I'll get rid of A, I'll get rid of D and E. And then I'll notice that 8 out of 400 is roughly 2 out of... And then I'll notice that 8 out of 400 is the same thing as 2 out of 100. So 2%. So that means that 48 out of 400 is exactly 12%. And then we notice that 56 over 448 is also close to 12%, even though it's not precisely 12%. So that means that our answer should be B, 12%. And indeed it is. Let's move on. Rule of 72. No, that's an easy one. If you know the rule of 72, you can solve this question in 10 seconds. We have eight years of steady growth and the sales have doubled. So that means one plus X percent to the power eight equals two. And that means by rule of 72 that X times eight is 72. And that means that X is roughly 9%. So the answer is 9%. If you don't know the rule of 72, I suggest that you go to the description of this video where I post a few links to materials and one of them is a link to the rule of 72. You should really get familiar with this one because you'll see it in lots of cases and in lots of uh, tests. So be prepared. Compound margin is another useful concept. And also to learn more about it, you can just go to the description of this video and then follow the links to, uh, to an appropriate video. The trick here is that we need to compare uh, five options and one option shows big growth but just for one year and other options show smaller growth but for more years. Of course it's very difficult to compute the numbers because even if we use the formula with the compound margin which is one plus x percent to the power n equals one plus n x percent plus compound margin. We won't be able to evaluate this compound margin here because it will be just too large. Remember that the product of n and x should be less than 45 in order for the compound margin to be less than 10 percentage points. And after 45, compound margin grows exponentially and it becomes really large. So we don't know this value, but what we know is that uh, compound margin is larger when nx, the product of nx is larger. So among the five options, the largest product of nx, which is the percentage rate and the number of years is e. So I guess the answer should be E 30% for three years. And if you want, you can do the calculations on your cell phone or on computer and check that indeed 30% growth for three years will get the biggest number. And that's our answer. And we, we are ready to move on. Number five, miscellaneous, everything else. Stuff that I wasn't able to categorize according to the previous buckets. Let's jump right in. Okay, number of properties. X is divisible by two, but not by five. Which of these statements is definitely false? Let's check all the statements one by one and then decide which one is false. X is prime. If X is divisible by two, but not by five, can it be a prime number? Yes, it can, if X is two. Two is a prime number. It is divisible by two, but not by five. So A, is not false. A can be true. So A is not our answer. B, X is a square number. Well, again, we, see, we can say that X equals four. In this case, X is a square number. It is divisible by two, but not by five. We cannot say that it's false. Cross it out. X is even. Yeah, uh, if X is divisible by two, then it's even by definition. So that is not false. Cross it out x equals x squared. So if x equals x squared, that means that x is zero or x is one. If x is zero, 
it is divisible by 2 and by 5. So x cannot be 0. But if x is 1, it is not divisible by 2. So that means that d is definitely false. And d is our answer. Just in case, let's check e as well. x is less than 10. Well, not necessarily. Let's say x is 12. It's divisible by 2, but not by 5. So e is not false. d is false, and d is our answer. Okay, so this is an inequality question and a pretty difficult inequality question. Let's try to figure out what we know from the question statement first and then do some transformations and see at what range we can arrive. So products A and B cost at least 0.10 pounds. So I'm going to write A, the cost of product A, greater than or equal to 0.10 and B greater than or equal to 0.10. We know that 5A plus 7B equals 470. And we need to find the possible range for 3A plus 5B. Okay, so if B is greater than or equal to 0.10, that means 2B greater than or equal to 0.20. That means that 5A plus 5B here is less than or equal to 4.7 minus 0.20 or 4.50. That means that A plus B is less than or equal to 0.90. And then 2A plus 2B is less than or equal to 180. And this in turn means that 3a plus 5b, which is nothing but 5a plus 7b minus 2a minus 2b, this should be greater than or equal to 470 minus 180 equals 290. Okay, so we know for sure that 3a plus 5b should be greater than or equal to 290. So this is our candidate for the lower bound of the range. Let's see if we can improve on it. If not, that should be our answer. By the way, if we look at the options right now, we see that all the other lower boundaries of the ranges are smaller than 290. So that means that d is out, we found a better range, C is out, we found a better range, B is out, we found a better range, and A is out, we found a better range. So, the answer should be E. Uh, at this point, we can say, okay, that's enough, let's mark E and move on, because we don't have time to waste on a test. But here, for the sake of education, let's try to figure out the upper bound of the range. Where does this number come from? In order to figure it out, let's look at this equation again. From here and also from the fact that b is greater than or equal to 0.10, we can say that 5a is less than or equal to 470 minus 7 times 0.10 equals 4. So a is smaller than or equal to 0.8. By following a similar logic, we can claim that B is less than or equal to 0.6. But that means that 3A plus 5B is less than or equal to 3 times 0.8 plus 5 times 0.6, which is 2 0.4 
plus 3, which is 5.4. And you notice that this result is quite useless, right? Because we already know that 5a plus 7b is less than that. So we need to change this approach a bit in order to make it useful to us. And this is how we can make this result useful. We know from the previous step that 2a plus 2b is less than or equal to 180. And then that means that 3a plus 3b is less than or equal to 270. I oh, know, I guess this actually doesn't help us much. So let's not waste our time here, but rather focus again on this expression here. From which we know that A is nothing but 470 minus 7B over 5. In this case, I'm going to continue here. Sorry for the mess. 3a plus 5b equals 3 times 470 minus 7b over 5 plus 5b. And the result is, once we do all the computations here, 2.82 plus 0.8b. But then we know finally that b is less than or equal to 0.6. That means that this whole expression here is less than or equal to 0.82 plus 0.8 times 0.6 equals 3.3. So this is where this 3.3 comes from. Yeah, you see, this question is quite complicated. Uh, even I, though I thought about this question before, went into the wrong direction and then had to spend some time figuring out the right solution approach. But again, as I said, here there is a great shortcut. Once you notice that the lower bound is 290, you don't need to do any further computations, you find the answer option, E, and then you move on. So that's it. But this, I think, is the hardest question in all the requirement tests that I saw. So that's okay. Well, that's it. Thanks for watching. If you found this video useful, please like and share. I'll pretty, very much appreciate it. And if you have any questions, write in the comments below. Thanks and cheers.